We are right back in the divisional breakdowns today. Very excited to talk about the NFC East. A lot of storylines for fantasy, and we want to remind you the Ultimate Draft Kit is available right now at ultimatedraftkit.com. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Thursday, July 25th. Andy, Mike, and Jason, the fantasy footballers back with you. Excited to be with you. The and news is flowing. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. back, baby. I mean, we do ten things to remember. Uh, that's a that's a show that we do as the season wraps up, so that we can remember some things heading into the new year. I gotta remember to just take it easy. No, oh, never take it easy on some of this news. I, I will, mean, I will never take it easy on it, training camp news. I mean, yeah, it's it's so true, Andy. Every single year, we've been doing this. You know, we got our live show coming up. It's going to be a tenth anniversary show. We've been doing this a long time. This is show 1,600. 1,600. And this time of year, like a, like a month from now, three weeks from now, when news is continuing to roll, it it can I can read it and I can let it go. Right now, because it hasn't been rolling and it's just coming out, every name is like, oh, I got I to gotta change. Yeah. Greg change Dulcich was the story of the first day of yeah. camp. It's not Now he's my number one target for Denver. <laughs> I mean, they, it's great because it's not just the talk of camp. It's the talk of the first day of camp. It's probably the talk of the town. Maybe. <laughs> Did you see Sean Payton body the other guy? I, uh, what's the other tight end? Kroll? Yeah, Kroll. The, the reporter goes, his name. The reporter's like, you know, talking about Kroll, about how he's been, you know, the best, the best player in camp. And he's like, well, hold up. Did you say the best tight end or the best player in camp? He's like, well, yeah, he's arguably been the best tight end in camp. He's like, no. Not even close. <laughs> Payton has been refreshingly honest about almost everything. I think he really likes arguing with beat reporters, and and that's fun. But, yeah, I mean, the news is coming in. Um, I mean, uh, the Borgogan, Kyle, who's uh, on the line right now. Kyle, you're with me, right? I'm here. Okay, so Kyle's here. And it was like, I don't remember. I can't find it right now, Kyle, but he was sharing. It was like five plays from Jacksonville camp and it was like mm -hmm. Brian Thomas dropped the pass and then Gabe Davis didn't catch one but then ETN did catch one yeah what's, like, wrong, what's wrong with that well there's nothing wrong with it it's just there's nothing you can take from that it is not actionable and we want to take action because we've been so thirsty you, yes yes we're so thirsty I mean based off of that one tweet I assume that Brian Thomas's his catch rate is at zero percent right now. Thank, well, this is what Mike's back for. You know, yeah, we, we missed them on so the last. So are the people listening to this show? No, we're, they want it. Okay, okay, yeah. Never mind that. Just totally take everything as uh, actionable information for the rest of the season, right, yes. Jay? Yes, overreact and do it immediately. The real policy that I try to put in place is that the news about players I have very relevant if it's good players. That I have, if it, if it's bad news, not great. You know, I don't pay attention to that. You don't have to roster these players already, say, in a dynasty league, so long as you have priors on them, thoughts, and so long as it backs up your preconceived notions, and it's very exciting times. Yeah, I mean, uh, now I'm seeing Audric Estime pictures coming through our DFS or our Dynasty podcast channel. That was more because we talked a lot about the, the Broncos running backs on the Dynasty pod. We all need... And new and, AJ Dillon in our list. And estimate, well, <laughs> estimate doesn't have the same definition as uh, Quadzilla up there in Green Bay. But he's got but the same speed. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he just he is a sturdy, sturdy young man. Well, we, I shouldn't have gotten into all of this because we do have a lot of news that we will tell you about uh, momentarily. The Ultimate Draft Kit available at ultimatedraftkit.com. You can check that out right now. I encourage you to do so. 
it's a good time. We've been making uh, tweaks and adjustments every day, pretty much. Based yeah. On, um, based on not actually overreacting to the news, but taking new information that comes out and uh, putting it through our filters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, th- there's news that I do enjoy reading about this time of year, like who's running with what offense. Yes. Like, I, I like to hear who's running with the first team and the second team. And um, we are getting quarterback news as well. Just um, head coaches' opinions on the Jacoby Brissett and Drake May situation, um, McCarthy and Darnold. And I don't know what your guys' opinion is on what happens in Minnesota, but, you know, if you're a Minnesota fan, I don't think you're rooting for Sam Darnold. I don't think either of those fan bases is rooting for the – you know, the, what, what, if for Arizona, that was when that's like the Sam Bradford when we had Josh Rosen. I, th- I think if you wanted to see the rookie, yeah, you you'll want to see the rookie, but it's a situation of I feel real confident at this point that Sam Darnold will start the season, so you're going to root for him because if if he does well, that means that the Minnesota Vikings are doing very well. If Darnold does well, yes, like if you get to that 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 bye week and the whole fan base isn't just screaming for McCarthy to come in. That means that they have a, a winning record and they're doing well. I I have a hard time remembering a situation like that where where they were. Where what where the, where the, that the, team with the incumbent mediocre the guy works out. You know, it, it Trubisky with Mike Glenn. I, I could think right. Of, I could think Sam of, Bradford with. Um, I can think know, of one example where it, it worked out. Was it a bad? Quarter, where a bad quarterback did well for the first half of the year? No. No. It was, what are you talking about, like a Hall of Fame quarterback? I'm talking held, about a Hall of Fame off, quarterback. Uh, a first round draft pick? Exactly right. Matt Leinert was the guy who was supposed to get the job going forward, but old busted Kurt Warner was going to, you know, he's going to start week one. And then turned out he wasn't busted yet. Sort of. But yeah, that, that, mean, that, that is the, not the situation of Leiner any 2024. Was there the year before and That's not what this situation is. And really, if you look at that bye week and you look at the defenses that the Vikings are the Vikings are playing, um, they start with the Raiders, great defense, then Browns, great defense, then Eagles, great defense. Two weeks later, the Niners, great defense. Right before the bye week, I believe they played the Jets. So, yeah, Darnold, you are the sacrificial lamb. Uh, baby. Yeah, he. I mean, their head coach just came out and said that he has no sacrificial baby. No, he said maybe. Oh, maybe. <laughs> he was baby. He was... I was like, you're correcting my <laughs> sacrificial lamb to an awful, horrendous sacrificial you thought, baby. You thought I was correct. I thought you were a monster. I thought I was like, you got it wrong, Jay. The phrase yeah. is sacrificial it's baby. baby. We all know yeah. this. Yeah. That's what oh, everyone man. has said. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, that maybe. That's a little better thing. I was going to say Kevin O'Connell came out and said he has no preconceived notion of the starter right now and that he's keeping his options open. But let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. We're putting Darnold out there as the proverbial <laughs> sacrificial <laughs> baby. baby. Yeah. <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Whew. It's, it's, gobble, it's, gobble, tough gobble, the, gobble. it's tough in the NFL. Amari Cooper agreed to a restructured deal with the Browns. Uh, gets a $5 million raise while the team guarantees him $20 million. Uh, some will be quick to point out this is not an extension. This is still his final year of the deal. They just, they're giving him some extra uh, cash. Because he deserves it, and he's been great. And so. we're talking about the NFC East on today's episode. We're going to talk about the Cowboys. And, man, I just can't believe Whoops. You want me to tell you about Michael Gallup retiring? Oh wow, same same news time, huh? Yeah. Wow. Good job, Cowboys. Uh, Michael Gallup was the post ACL contract that the Dallas Cowboys chose instead of keeping Amari Cooper. Yeah, the Dallas Cowboys. If you rewind, they bet on Gallup and Zeke, and that's where they put their money instead of Amari Cooper. And this is not revisionist history of like, well, sure, now you know it worked. Everyone then. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you paying big money to the running back? When you hear that Michael Gallup is retiring, and he had signed a five-year, $57 million contract after an ACL, Terry had shown potential. He had finished at wide receiver 16. That really? was that was the I, highest he had finished. He finished that high? I don't, I don't know if it was the year he got hurt or not. I know he has. I think that was his fantasy peak. But they obviously, they signed him to that deal. Um 
I guess 16 in certain formats. Uh, it looks like 22nd, but in 14 games played in 2019. Okay. All I'm saying is that Michael Gallup did not recover from an ACL injury. Correct. Like that's what happened. Yes. So, um, just kind of interesting that that for whatever reason this does happen from time to time. Yeah, we all expect the ahead of schedule. We're back. We're the same. It doesn't always. Yeah, it doesn't always happen. That is a Javante Williams statement in the sense <laughs> that he came back a little ahead of schedule and he just wasn't the same. And so now we expect him to get back to it. Just like we, you know, it, it's common that you know it takes takes two years. Sometimes you just don't come back. And so it's really, really hard. You can't just bet on the data. You have you have to see it. Do you guys have the quote? Oh, here it is. Um, from Dennis Allen on Kendra Miller. Hey. Kend Kendra Miller's banged up again. I think a week or two ago we were talking about how he had re been removed from our sleeper list due to the vibes around the backfield. Well, now he's hurt. Yeah. And the quote from Dennis Allen, head coach. Uh, this is via Nick Underhill, one of the best beat reporters in the industry. But this is the quote from Dennis Allen. That's a player who needs to figure out how to stay healthy because you can't make the team in the training room. Can't, <laughs> can't make the club in the tub. Get bodied. I mean, what a jerk. Uh, he's not wrong. Dennis, you know, he's, Dennis Allen or yes. Kendra Miller? No, <laughs> no I'm not going to say. A, he's a, a jerk to me. I'm not going to say. Hurting my feelings over and over, Jason. who got hurt is a jerk. He didn't try to get hurt. Yeah. You know, if he went out on a motorcycle without a helmet, you, you body that guy. If he's okay. practicing and trying and he gets hurt, and just criticizing him in the public just feels very Dennis Allen to me. Obviously, he's frustration not, there. He's not the only one. When when a player is hurt for essentially most of his rookie year, you're excited for next year. Comes back, he's already hurt. It's it's frustrating. Three injuries last year, I think. Something. I mean, he one he, preseason, one in season, and at least this one. He was drafted injured. Yeah. Also. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Um, but they kind of knew, like you know, it's like you chose to draft an injured guy. CD Lamb not reporting to the start of training camp, holding out. No contract for Dak. No contract for Parsons. They, <laughs> like, you, they have botched this, and like you have to sometimes as an organization, you do have to take certain financial leaps, like say. Uh, the Houston Texans with Nico Collins, like they didn't have to give Nico Collins that contract. Like they could have waited, but if you bet and you wait, and Nico Collins has a year anywhere close to what he had last year, now the size of that contract has ballooned, and that this is like they've done that now with these three guys. And I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what their cap situation is, but how do you? How do you pay all three of these guys? Where Dak will certainly be looking for the like to be the highest paid quarterback, like because it's the newest one, it will probably be the highest paid, if not the a top three. CD Lamb's going to want Jefferson money, who just reset the market. Parsons is going to want an outrageously large contract. They want to be has, the highest paid defensive yeah, player that he in that general. he has earned. And it's like you you should have sat down and tried to strike early with like CD Lamb. You, do you feel like there's an aspect here where like they did they did this with Dak once? This is not the first time we've been talking about Dak in the offseason. Like, is this I want my guys to play super hard because they're playing for a contract? I I I've always I wondered. Mean, I hate with the to Cowboys, ask that, but you gotta wonder. Uh, with the Cowboys and Dak, I've always felt like there's uh, almost a lack of true belief in the fact that he's like a you know, he's gonna get paid like a top three quarterback, and I think they think He's not really a top three quarterback. I don't want to pay, you know, a guy who's, you know, a, a the, the quarterback's like, 10. watch this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but that's how it feels with them. I, I agree with Mike. They made a mistake to not get CeeDee Lamb just early. Early in the process, get him a big contract. You know it's coming. And so the earlier you get there, the better it is by the time the new cap rolls out. Yeah, I you know, I often ask myself, will I see the Dallas Cowboys win a playoff game before I, you know, die? <laughs> and I don't know if that's going to happen until Jerry Jones. We need we need someone else. We need someone else running the Cowboys. Uh, Alvin Kamara. He is back. Ran hard. Kendra Miller is hurt. We talked about it. Right now, it's starting to it's cleaning up a little bit in uh, in terms of 
that backfield. Like the the I think where Alvin Kamara saw a depressed ADP in part, you know, the age, but it factors in when you have potential behind him. I don't think any of us would describe Jamal Williams as potential. No. I don't think any of us would describe Taysom Hill as any problem. He's been there with Kamara for a long time. Now Kamara's looking goal like line. a value. It, it could be a goal line problem. Yeah, but Kamara's never really been a huge goal He's line. He's not dependent on I mean, it. He, he used He's, to have Mark Ingram, you know, taking a bunch of touchdowns. Obviously, he was younger. I mean, I can't. But I, it's a passing game that's. It, yes, but, but. I mean, first. Alvin Kamara scored five total touchdowns last year. Uh, six total. He had one receiving. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm just saying, like the, the when it was the monster years, you know, sophomore season, 14 rushing touchdowns, dropped down to five, 16 rushing touchdowns. Like you're, but from the, a PPR, like a oh, per I'm, game perspective, he's a top 10 guy yeah, last year. Like still, I still really saw it. I'm just saying the for ceiling, you have to have rushing touchdowns. Brandon Ayuk is at, at camp, but not doing anything. A hold in. He is not losing money is what he's doing. When Maybe. you do a hold in, do you like grab your your gear but then walk super slow I from think, the locker room no. to the field to where like by the time you get to the field, practice is over? They had it. There was a hard knocks with the, the Chargers and someone was doing it. Yeah, that was Melvin Ingram. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah, Melvin you're Ingram. Just, you just kind of hang out. Yeah. You're just, just hanging watching. Out. Just you hanging got out good with your buddies. to training camp. Honestly, it's great. He's like, oh, man, I've got a reason to not – have to do training camp, but I'm not getting fined. It just and then if you're Jamar Chase, you're handing out towels, helping out the wide receivers like a water boy. That's what he's doing? Mm -hmm. I, we're still trying to get news on that, and that could be a – We don't have two sources. Well, I, it Jam could, Jamar Chase is not entering the final year of his deal like C.D. I think though. his is a maybe some he's sort two of years tweak away. Yeah. that they're taking it easy with. Maybe he wants that $5 million Amari Cooper got. But my point, Mike, even if it's a, if it's a little tweak – you telling me that Brandon and I you couldn't be handing out towels and being real supportive? Oh, okay, you know I see saying? what you're saying. That you hold in the right Maybe way. Maybe he is. Yeah, I I'm not know. saying he's not. I don't I'm know just what I should. To. Um, I'd be out there calling plays. Nick Chubb on the pup yep. list. Yep. And Matthew Stafford reported to camp after a team adjusted contract. Uh, and then there's some more early training camp hype. Yeah, this is the juicy stuff. Is this stuff. uh? couple of wide receivers that everyone loves. I never remember if I have to stop the train. I'd, I'd stopped it. Um, you, you can't stop Yeah, the you train. can't stop a train. Trains don't stop. You do. <laughs> Javante, <laughs> well, is that a shout out to NHTSA? It was, yeah. You you know. Um, Javante <laughs> Williams took the first team reps, every first team rep in camp in Denver, which... um. A lot of smoke around Javante Williams, but he's getting every opportunity to be the guy. Yep, for now. Yeah, we we said it on the last episode when people were debating whether him or Samaje were going to make the team. I said I'd be blown away if Javante is not on this team. The question is, does he still have juice? Jim Harbaugh uh, said he agree, or Justin Herbert agrees with Jim Harbaugh on Quentin Johnston getting a bad rap. He says we're expecting big things from him this year. Um. Uh, We've talked a lot about Quentin Johnston. He is a meme of sorts. And so I agree that like globalizing every play that he made in the entire year into like three or four drops is kind of stupid, but also the level of effectiveness that he had on so many snaps is also stupid. Like yeah, for the Chargers. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, but, but I will say this. I mean, like Jim Harbaugh is a brand new head coach. We've had lots of narrative street before where it's like, oh, this is not the guy I drafted. And I, I'm going to, you know, we could be sitting here talking about like he's not going to get the first team snaps. And DJ Chark is because he came aboard with Jim Harbaugh. He's going to get all the snaps. Like, I still think Quentin Johnson, you have to give him an opportunity. And Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman are going to say, hey, look, we did, he didn't get what he needed to get in the offense last year certainly wasn't supposed to have to step up in place of two injured players so he certainly was supposed to be able to should his number yes. be called as a first round rookie pick but this is the perfect type of news to me when I saw this I really wanted to go adjust my Chargers rankings I was like oh man so there's good positive buzz buzz about Quentin Johnston but I was like you know what this this is this is just people saying hey we expect big things 
They're looking good. It, it, it wasn't enough to undo what a season of tape and stats and historical data does. So th this is one I left alone. So at, so to that regard, then you then nothing can happen in preseason for your opinion of Quentin Johnston because no, it's not like you beat, don't believe he's going to be a starter. No, if the drum beat kept going and and oh, you know that's one of the things where it's like if if from now until kickoff the the news is constantly positive and it's always coming out that that oh, will this is just things. one strike of the drum you're needing more yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, you can't it, it's a four count man okay if i only give you one click we don't know what the tempo is i'm on ross St. brown my tempo. <laughs> said uh about jameson williams i know i've said this every year but i feel like this year is going to be huge for him i actually the quote is i know i've said this <laughs> kyle yeah. wanted this in the show e that's not a good way to start a quote. But he ends it with, I actually know it is going to be a big year for Jamison Williams. Okay. It, it, and uh, The Athletic is saying, um, this is Nick Baumgartner, Jamison Williams looks like a different player in training camp. Does he have a mustache or something? He <laughs> is wearing uh, a wig, actually. Yeah. Yeah, long, blonde. It's actually pretty cool when he runs because it, he's very fast. It is not impossible for either of those players. And their ADPs are at a point where it's Couldn't like be said better. It's perfectly fine. It will be, it will be a comical draft pick. Like when when someone else does it in the leagues that I'm in, I'm gonna laugh and point. But you're it's worth a shot. You're uh, on the clock. It's your last pick. These two guys are there. No oh, one else is. Okay. Which one are you going to take your shot on? I would go. Wow. The I would take huge. What about you, Andy? I was really hoping you only needed one answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go next so that you have to be the tiebreaker. I'm on the Jamison Williams side. Um, I I didn't believe in Cuge that much as a collegiate prospect, and then we saw that. It's been too long for Jamison Williams, but I did, man. I, I thought he was a superstar in college. So I would I'll, I'll go on the I'd probably, if it's last pick, a player I'm likely to drop, like, I think it's probably, I'll probably go with Cuge because... Like Jamison Williams can take a huge step forward, and he's still going to be the one, two, three, fourth option in the offense. At best, you yeah, can't pass Laporta, fair. can't pass Gibbs, that's, can't pass um, Amon Ra. That, that's my reasoning. Huge has the opportunity yeah, to be, be the one. one. That's that's a good point. It's a good um, point. So there you go. Uh, let's take a break. Get into the breakdown. Let's get divisional. All right, we are on our way through the NFC at this point. The NFC East. Mike, uh, you missed the NFC South. I wouldn't say I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really rude. You know, it was like, make us talk hey. about them, just two of us. I was surviving deadly rain yeah mike in was denver mike was at a uh an event with a friend in denver yep. when a i think it was a scene from twisters the new movie yes um pretty close you were you were in threat of your life that it, it was legitimately a an event trapped under a just a barely put together tent and it I, a microburst i don't know what to did call all this the thing. tents stay in place uh they did they were that's they were secured pretty well. Yeah, they American were 30, 30 foot down. And there there was moments of the, the storm happening where I was like, I have a percentage chance right now of <laughs> if lightning hits this thing, we're all we're You're all, all soaking out of wet, here. sideways rain, yeah. freezing cold. It was it was intense. Um Jason, still better than the Jason south. and I's <laughs> equity was so close to increasing. Yeah. All right, the NFC East. Dallas. The uh Earlier ridiculed Cowboys were twelve and five, so with they a, they won the division with a point differential of plus one ninety four. They they were Just awesome, outrageous. I already, I already can, I already know some of the debates we're going to be having in mere moments about these teams. Dallas was twelve and five. Philly was eleven and six. The Giants were six and eleven, and Washington was four and thirteen. Uh, this was the largest point differential between first and second place teams in the NFL. So Dallas. When they hit, they hit big. They were blowing people away. Well, if you remember the Eagles last year, the first month of the season, they looked awesome. And then they they kept winning games. While looking. But, but they looked horrible. They, their performances were bad, and 
you know, their defense was good enough and their offense was good enough to to squeak out a win. Um, you know, I believe they they went eight and three in those one score games. They just the the ball bounced their way, but they looked bad pretty early on, despite being eleven and six. Cowboys, they were just great. They were eleven and six with a point differential positive five points. How do you, that's impossible? Yeah, I mean Dallas's defense gave up almost 115 fewer points on the year than the Eagles, and they scored 75 more points. So it, it was a, a big difference, even though the records were close. And um, I'm excited to talk about, you know, all of these teams. There's storylines for all of them. We'll kick it off with Dallas. By the way, lots of names and faces just moving around in the division. Saquon going from the Giants to Philly. Dan Quinn from the, the Cowboys to Washington. Kellen Moore from the Cowboys to Philly. And, uh, you know, don't leave Zach Ertz out of the way. Oh, of course. <laughs> going, uh, you know, former Eagle going to Washington. All right, Dallas, 12-5. and five. Projected win total was 9.5 last year. This year, projected at 10.5. Um, they have the 10th most difficult schedule, according to Warren Sharp. They were number one in the league in points per game last year. There's a reason that if you took Mike's uh, very astute advice, like I did um, halfway through the year to pick up Dak Prescott, that he won you a title. I mean, he was responsible for lots of championships. You know, if you were able to get rid of, like, maybe you were rolling Tua halfway through the year yeah. and you were able to get Sounds somebody. Sounds like an incredible maneuver. Uh, dude, just get rid of that guy, go get Dak, and move forward. I mean, they were incredible. They were from weeks 8 through 18. Which is after their bye week. They were number one in points per game. Number four in plays per game, eighth in pass percentage, third in red zone plays, sixth in red zone touchdown rate. All for a team that said goodbye to Kellen Moore, who is now in division. But they, the narrative last offseason was, oh, no, what's going to happen to the great Cowboys passing offense? Well, to be fair to that narrative, weeks one through six, they were 27th in pass percentage. Like and and the, the truth is the big difference between before the bye and after the bye was when they got to the red zone. Before the bye, they weren't throwing the ball. They were running, and they were ineffective with Tony Pollard and, and Rico Dowdle. And then after the bye, they're like, let's just keep throwing the ball yeah, like we did last year. And they it worked like gangbusters. Like they fully – it was just – guys, what are we doing here? We have a number one wide receiver. Why are we not acting accordingly? And then they did, and hey, really good things happen. Imagine. Imagine in the NFL – Unle unleashing your offense with your number one wide receiver. For fantasy purposes, CeeDee Lamb and Dak were revelations, but Tony Pollard wasn't. The expectations going into this season for Pollard were not met. Couldn't score touchdowns um, despite the offense being – like, for Tony Pollard, if you told me before the season began last year with all the hype around him, if I told you, just so you know, Dallas is going to be the number one team in points per game. <laughs> like, oh, well, I'm going to move like, him up. He's probably number two. Yeah. off of the draft boards uh, last year, but it just didn't work out. Um, now it's Mike McCarthy and um, and not Kellen Moore. Last year was, or rather, last year was McCarthy, the year before Kellen Moore. Things got going. They got contracts to figure out. There aren't a lot of changes. They bring Zeke back. Okay, whatever. Michael Gallup's not a member of the team. It, there's a lot of stability in what they're doing. Head coach. The offensive system, the quarterback, the best players. The lack of a running game or the, the not elite running game, I'll say. I mean, it, it, it'll be interesting to see how they start the year to see if they s still want to double down on the, like, let's run it inside the red zone and see if we can score. And if they do, maybe the passing game will take a step back. But the nice thing is with Zeke and Dowdle, this version of Zeke, I would expect that you're going to have a reroll of last year offensively. They're going to throw the ball a lot and they're going to throw the ball in the, in the red zone because you know, to to add to what you were saying about Tony Pollard, of like, oh, how high would you, if you knew some of these things that were coming, like they were the number one scoring offense, what if you knew that Tony Pollard had 16 carries inside the five? Right. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. But he turned it into three touchdowns. It was ineffective. So I do think they're going to keep throwing the ball, the ball in there. But just real quick on the running backs, between the two of them, I don't know. Like, Zeke looked extremely washed last year. We we talked about him on the Dynasty podcast of 3% of his uh, carries turned into a 15-yard gain. It was like the worst of qualifying running backs. Rico Dowdle's 26. He really has seen no action. 
but on a yearly basis, we see eight teams or so that don't have a top 24 ADP running back, and then four of those teams have someone who finishes in the top 24, and the, what correlates is either it's a it's a true workhorse, I don't think we have that situation, but you have an elite offense. And like those are the, the two things of, of these late-round running backs. So both of these guys, it's gross. It's, it is, but I would I'd sprinkle – these guys into your teams. I would how bet good, on the Zeke side. Which yeah, side I'm, I'm very on the Zeke side. But how, that's fine. How 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 good of an offense was New England last year? Not good. No, because Zeke ended the year 17th, first, 33rd, 10th, 23rd, 23rd. So right, be- because, he caught a million passes because in that time he was a full workhorse. This is true, but he also showed that he can do what Pollard did last year, which was to just catch the ball. Just yeah. catch the ball out of the backfield. And if Pollard were drafted where Zeke is being drafted this year, Pollard would have, would have been feeling like a league winner last yeah, year. Yeah, Instead, yeah. he was drafted, you know, first, second round. It's not a, a running back room that we're looking for explosive league winning weeks, but like Mike said, sprinkle in some opportunities for a number one offense. Yes. Brandon Cooks. Where are you with Brandon Cooks? Because, you know, Ferguson, that was kind of fun last year. For Brandon Cooks, he had a game or two, but it was it was like Brandon, if he scored a touchdown, he was top yeah. twenty four. Yeah, Brandon Cooks had a great stretch after the bye week, um, where he was decently consistent and pretty valuable for fantasy. But it was on the back of touchdowns. His yards per game, I mean, 49, 7, 42, 45, 37, 10, 14. But it was fourteen and a touchdown. It was forty five and a touchdown. It all you know, he just scored so many touchdowns. Where I, th- I think you need to look at kind of the truth of how it came by, uh, how it came about. And I'm, I find myself early in the off season, I was like, I was not looking as deeply into Brandon Cooks, and I was kind of in. I find myself bypassing him now. Three games last year over four catches. Yeah, he's not involved enough for me to be confident in a lineup. If you're in a best ball league and you're just going to get the touchdowns, fine. But I would rather – obviously, CeeDee Lamb is a is awesome. Everyone wants him. If you're at the top of your draft, congratulations. And then in the passing game, I'm I, I'm Jake Ferguson. I think he's he, his red zone opportunities last year were elite. He led all tight ends with 25 targets in the red zone. Best. Uh, <laughs> I, I really like Jake Ferguson. He's – He's my final rip cord at the tight end position. Uh, I'm I'm more in on Brandon Cooks than you guys. Not that I, I, it's not madly in love and knocking people out of the way so I can draft them a few rounds high. But it's wide receiver 64 and ADP right now, 13th round. He caught he, but he did catch catch eight touchdowns, like eight touchdowns in double digit range. Like when you're there's there's a lot of time when you're in the trenches and you're like I have nobody to start. I think Brandon Cooks is is a good depth wide receiver. I mentioned their schedule, like their schedule was part of the equation in going in on Dallas last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, although the run for Dak was like week six through the end of the year, so yeah. all but five weeks. But they had a better schedule this year, a more difficult schedule. But look at the start to the season. They are okay. They've got a tough one on the road in Cleveland. Yeah, okay. And um, they are underdogs in Cleveland in week one. But then they're favored in five consecutive games, New Orleans, Baltimore, the Giants, Pittsburgh, and Detroit. But being favored in five straight, heading into the bye, um, nothing about the schedule is intimidating me or talk, talking me out of Dallas to start the year. Yeah, I can agree. I, I can't tell if you're thinking, no, Jason, I, or you're just head bobbing. And no, like, it was, I, I, I would say, like, I'm not going to, the, the players that I'm going after, Ferguson is basically free, so I'm not going to be talked out by schedule. CD Lamb and Dak are you're you're going in on them, and so the schedule's not going to. But uh, the the opening schedule of Cleveland, New Orleans, Baltimore, I mean, I know they're favored in two of those three, but but all three are really good defenses. So you know, I'm not worried about New Orleans. Not New Orleans, but yeah, I'm, Cleveland I'm and worried. Baltimore. Where where are you guys just overall with Dak, of like compared to the field? Like if they would like if we left our draft with Dak, we're we're happy about. Oh, it. very happy. But it's like he is being drafted as the QB nine. He's going in the seventh round. It, like, do we you have, have him. We have him as the Andy has him as the quarterback six. I've got him as the quarterback seven. You've got him as the quarterback eight. So I think we'd be okay with that. I'm. am just saying. Like, are you? He's in, not one of my targets in 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 mock drafts. I don't remember any of us saying okay. This in this build, 
I'm going to target Dak. It's just kind of you're okay leaving with him. I think the only time I would be targeting Dak is if I started the draft with CD okay. and I'm looking for that. In stack. the last three years, which you can pull this up in the Ultimate Draft Kit, we have a career fantasy finish chart. We call it the snapshot tool. Over the last three years, the top five most consistent point scorers at the position, Allen, Mahomes, Hertz, Herbert, Dak. Yeah. So Dak's above, you know, obviously Burrow in that stretch. He's above Lamar in that stretch. Um, I, so, you know, there there are only a few guys that are like, like you know that they're going to re-roll, like you said. They're going to re-roll what this offense does. Mm -hmm. So is it a vote for Zeke in the red zone or a vote for Dak? And at least in that regard, I'll be on the Dak side. Philly's 11-6, and six, or was 11-6. and six. They had a projected win total of 11.5 last year. This year it's at 10.5. You talked about a tale of two uh, seasons. They were, you know, 10 and 1. And during that stretch, third in points per game, fourth in plays per game, fifth in run percentage. After that point, they were 20th in points per game, 18th in plays per game, 18th in run percentage. So um, it collapsed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Nick Sirianni, I just saw this interview. Yep. Uh, it was, it, and I. I won't be able to tell you who it was with. It was through The Athletic, one of their podcasts. But it was somebody that was really connected in Philadelphia, and they were talking about the strained relationship relationship between Nick Sirianni. It was Diana Rossini. Thank you. And um, Jalen Hurts. And how this was a grind. The victories were a grind last year, even when they walked out with a win. And Nick Sirianni was calling plays. And now he's going to try to step back from calling plays this year, but you've seen Nick Sirianni in a in a presser. Give me three losses in a row and tell me who's calling plays. That's all I'm going to say. Like, there's going to be a heavy hand if things don't go right, in my opinion, from Nick Sirianni because there's not patience in Philadelphia. That has never been an attribute of that city and that team. You need to win, and you need to win today. So it is a you know, Kellen Moore's third team in three years. So I like what Kellen Moore does. I like what his concepts are and what they bring to the table. But Dallas moved on from them, right? And it mm -hmm. didn't work in Los Angeles, obviously. Uh, a lot of peripheral reasons you can you can blame. But I'm just saying, if it doesn't work in Philadelphia, that's three times in three years. You're not going to be talking about Kellen Moore in the offseason as bringing hope to a team. Yeah, if he fails, you won't. But I, I do not expect him to fail. He didn't fail in Dallas. Dallas had a great offense, and that was a mutual – it wasn't like he was fired there. And then last year, if you remember, to start the season, the Chargers' offense was great. Justin Herbert was one of the best in the league. You know, Keenan Allen was unbelievable. The team collapsed. Justin Herbert got injured. They lost a ton of games. Their head coaching, you know, circus show was, was put to death. Um, but now you end up, you know, Adam Gase was a great offensive coordinator when he had Peyton Manning, you know, and it turns out he wasn't a great offensive coordinator. I just think like if Kellen Moore is average and you've got Jalen Hurts and Devontae Smith and AJ Brown and you add Saquon Barkley and you've got a top end offensive line, I think he'll succeed. And so this is uh, the... The slot guy is very interesting to me from a Kellen Moore perspective. This is what I'm so interested interested to see this training camp. If we can figure out who is that motion guy, who's the guy in motion, who's the guy in the slot that has that was last year's Keenan Allen and Ceedee Lamb the year prior for Kellen Moore systems, because it it could be Devontae Smith. It could, yeah. It could also be AJ Brown. Just because yep. he's the big strong guy doesn't mean you know. I saw Matt Harmon talking about this. Like Matt Harmon thinks. That AJ Brown will have that role. I I, I think it's going to be Devonte Smith. Maybe that's just hopeful thinking because I got him. <laughs> but I want whoever that role is because it's it's hyper targeted. Not Paris Campbell though. No, no. Which to put some context, last year pre snap motion, eleven percent of plays for the Eagles, by far the lowest rate in the NFL. The Chargers were eighth last year, and it it really is. It's oversimplifying an NFL offense, but it's. Just the teams who have elite offenses use motion all the time, and it's like it's a it's a hard thing to argue against. I don't know if you're a, if you're a coach calling plays, why would you not look at what Miami and San Francisco and all these guys who are in L.A. And, and, and they're running up huge numbers on offense 
Why would you not see what they are doing? Green Bay, fourth in pre-snap motion behind Dolphins, Rams, and 49ers. Detroit, great offense. Baltimore, great offense. Yeah. The, um, it, it sets up the defense. You get to see what they're playing yeah. a lot more if you've got something before you snap the ball for the defense to have to counter. And uh, I guess I guess I'm not I'm not trying to throw a bunch of cold water on a bunch of talented players for fantasy, but last year was the first time that we got to see the fact that you could have a worse outcome than you expect. To go on the run that they did, being as bad as they were on the offensive side, was the first time we ever saw it from this perfect, impervious offense. So, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, for the you know, it's just the first time that you saw it. And so that gives you doubts about it always working for Philadelphia in a, in a division where they'll be fighting. They still have a 10.5 uh, win total. Their offense is really easy to draft for fantasy. Right. Yeah, it's very focused. It's super, you know, it's Saquon. I, you know, I'd love to talk about him momentarily, but you mentioned Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown, Jalen Hurts is at the top of our list. Um, but Saquon specifically, it should work, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. Yes, it, it absolutely should. You've got a great offensive line, a good offense with plenty of scoring opportunities. DeAndre Swift, you know, a lot's been made about the tush push and that you're not going to have the running back running in touchdowns from the one yard line and you no, you probably won't but you will have him running him in from the five yard line and DeAndre Swift had plenty of opportunities inside the five he just always got to the two or the one and then Jalen Hurts said thanks buddy I'll take it from here Saquon should cross that should plane finish, yeah. yeah uh so yeah I mean I think there's a lot of excitement and optimism that they get the offense figured out and it looks like what we were used to you know, at the tight end position, I think we've all we're all in the ship has sailed boat for Dallas Goddard. Not because he can't have a good game or a good performance or even be a streaming tight end for a number of weeks, but the injuries and the the where he falls in the pecking order, it, it no longer gives us the confidence. Like if it's, an injury happens during the year, I will be picking Goddard up. Sure, to be a you know a, a streaming tight end. It's just a matter of because everything is so focused. Like I am, my chips are all the way in on AJ Brown this year like he's the wide receiver six and ADP so that's not very bold uh but it's just like either Devonta Smith or Dallas Goddard can s succeed with AJ Brown I don't think both of them can and e even then for me if Smith becomes that motion man Jason like you are crossing your fingers and toes and eyes and and wishing for then maybe we see some true ceiling but it's like 95 for 1,207, that's a great year, but then followed up with 81 for just over 1,007. It's like he feel Devonta Smith feels like he is – he's drafted like at his ceiling where so many things have to go wrong for the team for it to go right for Smith in fantasy. That's, that's my only issue with his ADP. Yeah, I mean, last year I think he was overdrafted. He, he was a I, – I think he was – near the end of the second. It was, was like he? him, okay. Jalen, and, and T. Higgins, the, all, the three, yeah, two, yeah, the yeah. three twos yes, last right. year. They were drafted really, really high. Right now, I don't think he's drafted at his ceiling at all. He's the wide receiver 22 in average draft position. He can definitely finish above that. I mean, he he finished above that last year, and then obviously that was down. He was the wide receiver 10 his sophomore year. But I was saying, yeah, 10, wide receiver 10 at 12.2 points per game. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, and then that was also, I think, that was like Goddard missed. Goddard missed. Huge a, yeah, chunk he was, he's definitely that, much better when Goddard. That's what gone. I mean. Of like something has to go wrong for the team for Smith to come but through. But I will say Dallas Goddard. He's no spring <laughs> chicken. He's been in the the league what like seven years, and I think his rookie season is the last time he's played a full season. All right. The New York Giants were six and eleven last year. They actually started one and five. They finished five and six over their final eleven games. They are projected to win seven and a half this year. It's at six and a half. Oh, <laughs> you! I heard they are projected to win seven and a half. I was very surprised, and then you said this year at six and a half. I was like, that feels that feels much more realistic. Sacrificial baby. <laughs> they said, "Hey, this twenty ninth ranked offense needs to get rid of the one player we wanted to watch." So they did, and Saquon left in division. They did go out and spend draft capital on Malik Neighbors, who we're all excited to see at the 106. I couldn't help but, you know, you talk about training camp. First video I saw today. From Daniel, Neighbors? Daniel Jones. No, no, no. It wasn't Neighbors. Oh, It was oh. Daniel Jones with a 
just the simplest five foot screen pass air mailing is running back out of the backfield i saw one of it was funny because of the caption that came with it i don't know if they were being fun or not but it was like he you know jones throws a dot to malik neighbors and neighbors ends up dropping the ball but it was also like the floatiest just drop so it was uh, but not worried about that for malik neighbors just worried about the actual like how intense the excitement is for malik neighbors because it from a talent perspective coming into the nfl draft where you had marvin harrison jr who by many is looked at as this is this is a bust proof pick for the nfl a lot of people like you heard gm saying like no we actually we have neighbors above marvin harrison jr for our particular offense so are you jason it feels like you have softened and like risen a bit on malik neighbors because he's going at wide receiver 20 that's uh, aside from Mar- Marvin Harrison Jr., that's tied with Amari Cooper, the second highest rookie wide receiver ADP ever, and you're relying on this Giants offense and Daniel Jones, and it's it freaks me out. Yeah, I, I I don't blame you for having it freak you out. I think that rookie wide receivers have oftentimes in in, in the recent NFL history they've been good bets, but but a lot of times it's the second half of the year when you right. really get their value. And so you might be disappointed a little bit to start the season when you start with Malik Neighbors. However, the talent, the explosiveness, uh, the comp for him, I think for a lot of people, certainly for me, was Jamar Chase in college, not just because he played on the same team. He's got the same kind of body and athleticism um, and that explosive ability. The The depth chart of Malik Neighbors and Wandale Robinson and Darius Slayton and Jalen Hyatt and Allen Robinson. And, you know, Wait, that, what? <laughs> I totally forgot. That says <laughs> that says to me that it's like 130 targets guaranteed to neighbors. Now, they this isn't a great uh, prolific offense. The scoring opportunities might not be there. But because of his explosive athleticism, if you just put the ball in his hands, you know, 80, 90, 100 plus times. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is Jalen Waddle all over again. Yeah. Not, not the perfect prototype, but the fact that Waddle was drafted in the top, uh, what was he, pick six? Yeah, was, something was like that. Something so like same right pick as neighbors. Yeah. Went to a team that no one had any confidence in the offense in Miami and finished at wide receiver 16 with a over 100 catches. I view it that way. I have him ranked at 17, so I have him ranked kind of in that how Waddle finished his rookie year. I do think he's capped a little bit by Daniel Jones and the potential for a quarterback change to happen. Like If they lose in ball games, I don't know if Daniel Jones survives the whole season. Sure. But it's, it's so like the stat is – We've only seen one rookie finish in the top 30 if he is on a bottom 10 passing yards per game roster. So if Daniel Jones finishes bottom 10, you're, based off of history, your probability of hitting is very, very low. And that it, one man it, was Mike Evans who had 12 touchdowns. It is ironic, though. that That's a little bit of a chicken or an egg it stat. Is. Because if Malik Neighbors is great, and he finishes in the top 30 at wide receiver, then they probably won't have a bottom 10. At the end of the season, they probably won't finish in the bottom 10 of passing because maybe he took a couple to the house 70 yards, and then all of a sudden their their numbers are good. So that, If you want to bend it positively for Giants fans out there looking for a crumb of optimism in this division, Daniel Jones has not had the weapons necessary to succeed at the NFL level, nor the offensive line. I like those, think, things have yeah, not, those things have not been in place for him. So this is at least... Like, if you are stuck with Daniel Jones, which they are, be stuck with the ability to find out if it would have ever worked, right? Like, getting Malik Neighbors is a, it's the ability to know definitively if Daniel Jones is your quarterback of the future or not. Like, if you can't get it done this year, it's over. Andy, did you watch the hard knocks? Or I know, I know I've Mike seen, and I have. I've, I've not, seen some I'm of I'm not them. caught up. Okay, yeah. so, but you, you saw enough to, to what I'm saying. When they were talking about Daniel Jones, their general manager was constantly saying, "We've, you know, he's never had an offensive line. Instead of paying Saquon Barkley, we need to get him an offensive line, and we need to get him a weapon. If there's an offensive weapon there at six, over and over and over, he talked about improving this offensive line. Yeah, baby, from thirty to twenty nine this year. Yeah, and according to Warren Sharp, dead last. Like what? You talked a big game, man. You did nothing with the offensive line. He kept talking about, yeah, no, you'll see Daniel Jones if we get him a good offensive line, and then he didn't." So, sorry, Giants fans. Devin Singletary is the new running back in New York. Eh. 
I mean, experience with Brian Dayball and his system. Very. Um, well, how would you describe? Give me one word to describe Devin Singletary. Com- Motor. Okay, oh, nice, that's nice, nice. Yeah, 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 nice. Jason, what did you say? I was going to say competent. He's yeah, very I was going to say competent. solid. Yeah, I I think Singletary is an above average running back. He and, um, I, and he will he will outproduce running back thirty three, which is where he's being drafted in the back of the ninth. Now that could mean he's running back twenty nine, and it's of <laughs> of no consequence. But he is he is an interesting name of being a starting running back that like if you want to bet on the Giants and and Malik Neighbors being able to help turn things around and get into just maybe the middle of the pack, that would be great for Singletary. Yeah, you brought up something when they first signed, which seemed kind of outlandish, but I, I, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And, and this sounds almost hot takey. This this isn't. Please this isn't oh, a sound bite yeah. or clickbait. Yeah. But it is possible for the New York Giants that Devin Singletary is almost a better back for them. Right. Because Saquon is a home run hitter. Saquon, Saquon, when he was the whole offense and they had no weapons, they had no passing game, he just looked for every single play a way to score a touchdown when he got the ball. He no says, matter if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. Exactly right. And Devin Singletary is going to get his three yards to four yards every single play. He's going to go north. He's going to fall forward. And ironically, he'll have easier opportunities because he's not Saquon Barkley. And he's not going to just face the entire defense coming in going like, how do we stop Devin Singletary? So for the Giants and their actual offense, which l- leaks back to the Malik Neighbors conversation, it it might not be it might not be the downgrade that people might be worried about going from Saquon. Yeah, Kyle's coming in with hot stats here of talking about a scheme of man. They're like in running, there's essentially there's man or there's zone running. Saquon ranked 49th out of 49 running backs in success rate on man gap runs. Like he was not not getting done what he needed to get done. They, Which offensive line is factors into that, but just saying like yeah, they're not going to we'll be see. favored in a lot of games, but they do start the year against Minnesota, who could be Darnold or McCarthy. They face Washington in week two, okay. which is another rookie. Could be could be two and zero, and then Deshaun Watson in week three in Cleveland. That'll be a tough game. Yeah, the, that'll be a tough one. Um, quick break back with Washington. All right. The Manders, they went four and 13 and, uh, they're starting over. We have a new owner. We've got a new GM. We've got a new head coach. We got a new quarterback. Wow. We got this, an old Eckler. This is really like the complete reboot. Reboot. They should just rebrand the team. They name actually too. are going to rebrand the are team. Are they really? Yeah. Is that official? Yeah, it won't be this year. I've heard I've heard but rumors there were, of there, they're gonna do there's it. There's a lot of discussion about it there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you had this opportunity and then Well, that no. was a different different Pre- ownership. Yeah, yeah. Those are Schneider days, man. I know. I'm s i am the Commanders is it's not a good name. New Sorry. offensive coordinator, Cliff Kingsbury, as well. Sweet. They had the fourth worst point differential of any team over the last five years last year. Wow. It was so frustrating because they threw the football more than any team in the league, and it was a BUST how, bust how? <laughs> season for Jahan Dotson. Not an impressive, you know, Terry McLaurin always does the best he can do. Yeah. I, in fact, I've seen some people be like, why are you not all about Terry McLaurin this year? And it's because, man, we're worn out. You're we're li- worn out. We're, we're a little bit we worn are, out. We're we're we, also, down. we also understand the ceiling. The ceiling is not there for Terry McLaurin. It, it, it doesn't exist because... He can't DJ more? No. Uh, well, here, here's the thing. Can he outproduce? Can he be a very good pick? Absolutely. He's the wide receiver 33 right now in ADP. But if you look at his career, he's the the wider he's finishes the wide receiver 28, 21, 25, 14 and 28. That's like he is a wide receiver 2, but he's not a wide receiver 1. Now if he finishes at the wide receiver 14, 15 and you draft him as 33, that's fantastic. He's still got the talent and this is a quarterback upgrade. Rookie quarterbacks don't throw a lot of touchdowns. A mobile rookie quarterback that might end up running in a few touchdowns might even throw a, you know a few fewer 
Is that is that how you? You could have just said fewer. Yeah. It would have worked. Yeah, it, it, that would have worked. Yeah, you could have just said he could he could throw even okay, fewer. Okay, he could throw it's even like fewer. It's like a double double negative. There. Okay, so he's throwing more. You could say uh, fewer squared. But it's one of those things where the you know a rookie quarterback does not usually bode well for the wide receiver, and then you combine that with just who Terry McLaurin is, which is a really good wide receiver who's not elite. He's not going to be out there finishing in the top ten at the position. So there is that fatigue. I I, I don't mind taking him where he's being drafted. Uh, are you guys? I just ha I haven't been because of that, like lacking of a belief that he can finish top ten. I yeah, he's he's not an exciting pick. And it, it doesn't feel like you're drafting to win when you take Terry. Yeah, it kind of doesn't. But let's put that to the test real quick. I want to see. Give me some names around him. Yeah. yeah so the, the wide receivers around him, Roma Dunze is going ahead of him. I'd rather have Terry. Uh, he, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll go Terry there. Christian Kirk or Terry McLaurin? I'll take that. Neither. <laughs> I'll go Kirk. All yeah, right. I'll go Kirk. Behind him is uh, here's the three wide receivers behind him: Jaden Reed, Jordan Addison, Xavier Worthy. I'll take Reed over him. Yeah, but I'm okay with McLaurin over the other two. I agree completely, Andy. So he's he's going in about the right spot. Um, one of the big discussions, obviously, with the wide receiver room: Jahan Dotson. Can he bounce back? Can he? Can he serve? You know. Yes. Okay, tell us why, yes. Jason. Because he's not a bad wide goodness, receiver. goodness, I don't want to talk about I, it. I, I get it. I get it. He was uh, not the greatest call last year, but this is not a player who spent his entire life being good at football, being drafted in the first round of the NFL draft, coming out as a rookie and scoring seven touchdowns in 12 games and looking great, and then all of a sudden he forgot how to play football. What happened was he was on a putrid, awful team with Sam Howell, who spread the spread the ball around a lot and ineffectively, and it w it was a bust season. Now, the hope that we had coming into last year was that this rookie who looked good, who was a first round pick, was going to take that leap and become a superstar. Obviously, I think that hope is done, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying hey, he's going to bounce back to be sensational. But this is a 24 year old first round wide receiver who now has you know a top five. NFL pick at quarterback to pair with him and there's not a lot of competing targets like last year one of the biggest problems for Jahan Dotson was Curtis Samuel Curtis Samuel soaked up targets in that system he gone so it's like Jahan Dotson's the clear number two here and if you know if, who's getting all those Curtis Samuel targets Zaggers <laughs> gross the Dotson thing's tough because you know first round wide receiver I I you know, it's awesome, but two years outside the top 50 at the position, year three breakout with a rookie, it's it's quite, you know, just it's against the odds. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, all I'm saying. It, like, I, I believed in the talent. I loved what I saw on the field. Yeah, his rookie year. I didn't love year, it last year. His rookie year, I mean, if you talk about his fantasy finish, he was the wide receiver 50, but he missed. It was like 12 games, right? Yeah, only he only played 12 games on a, on a points-per-game basis. He was pretty good for a rookie, almost 10 points per game. Yeah, but we only got to see 35 catches, right? So not a big sample. I obviously believed it. Didn't work out last year. The team threw the ball so ineffectively. Jaden Daniels uh, comes in with just an incredible senior season at LSU. Heisman winner. Everything you saw on tape last year was, you know, Burrow-esque yes. at, at LSU, where that final season was a step up of everything we saw Watched him out here at ASU all the time. This was a different player, but has a lot going, a lot of challenges ahead of him. You have an offensive line that's ranked in the bottom third. You have a whole new offense to learn. The balance of, uh, you know, throwing the football, when to run it, how this team's going to play on the defensive side. You know, there's just a lot of problems here, and a lot could be put on his shoulders early. And you talk about like McCarthy getting an opportunity or Drake May to wait. We're not expecting that here. No, Jaden Daniels was drafted to be the starter. You know, they let Jacoby Brissett go. They traded away Sam Howell. Jaden Daniels will be the starter week one. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the player that I want from this team because he's going to run a lot uh, as a as a quarterback. You're going to score extra points in fantasy. We all know that. And if – Jahan Dotson steps up, or if it turns out that uh, um, Austin Eckler can provide something in the passing, everything goes to Daniels. And Daniels is a very late, 
He's the last drafted quarterback that is an elite rushing mobile quarterback. And it his comp to me has always been not as good, but very similar to Kyler Murray in the sense that he's a little bit undersized. He's a great passer and a great runner. And that was who Kyler Murray's you know, offensive coordinator, well, head coach sure. was in Cliff Kingsbury. And so he's coming into that system. And I believe Kyler was the quarterback seven his rookie year. Um, I'll double check that. But I mean, it, it, the system will work They're They've got a fast pace of play. So I like Jaden Daniels quite a lot. The running back room is where I think there will, I think there will be surprise value there. Yeah, you do? Okay. Yeah, I think Let's Brian. I think Brian Robinson is going to be. He's going to outperform his ADP significantly. Brian Robinson showed last year how good he can be in the passing game. I think he's going to do a lot for Cliff Kingsbury in this offense. I think Brian Robinson is a good player, and I think the passing, the pass catching chops. Um, I don't think we're going to see as much of Eckler as we might hope, and I think Brian Robinson is going to be much better than. RB thirty five and ADP in the la in the late ninth. It's it, what it comes down to. What do you believe about Austin Eckler? Like what is left? Because yes, the season in totality was it was pretty close to a disaster. Doo doo. I had him on my roster. Doo doo. I know, but I just want to remind you. Week you turned down a trade. Week for him. one. Week one. He was the running back three. He looked awesome. And then he ends up finishing that game with the the ankle sprain. Takes some time to come back. Running back six, running back four, running back four. And then it all really fell apart. So it's just what juice does Eckler have left? What is the split? It's like if, if Brian Robinson is really involved in the passing game, then he will be he will be a huge value because the early work is going to be Brian Robinson. You know, who, you know who is a good pass catcher? Who's that? Antonio Gibson. Yeah. And he's a part of this backfield for multiple years. Brian Robinson has earned his way into the good graces of this coaching staff. And, like, the problem with Eckler at his age is that you can do it sometimes. You can do it here and there. I mean, Zeke had a 72-yard touchdown run last year, called back on a penalty. <laughs> but he did. He did. I mean, uh, just, you, just needed some illegal mo no, action to get no, him out No, no, he was there. away from the play. Um, Austin Eckler is just at that stage of his career where sometimes it's going to be okay. And we're not even talking about injury. Like, injury has been a huge problem for Eckler. So, look, I just wanted to be on record saying that I believe Brian Robinson will have a, a valuable year for fantasy. I have warmed on both of the running backs. I think this is a very right. nebulous situation that I don't want to touch and nobody wants to touch, which is why they're in the ninth round. But in the ninth round, you have the potential of, you know, if, if it was the ankle injury that caused Austin Eckler's problems, they signed him in free agency, brought him in. He's a great proven vet. If he's got that juice still, he could be good. And like you said, Andy, if he, if he doesn't, Brian Robinson could be good. I think one of these two guys will outperform this value. And I I haven't really been drafting either of them, but I'm 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 completely open to at the end of the year we look back and go, oh yeah, that was actually I mean, a good pick. We have teams in our league of record that trade away draft picks. We're we're thin in the middle rounds, and you got to find value later. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to look there. There's a lot to account for for Jaden Daniels. And Brian Robinson was, like, he was really good for the first half of last year, despite the fact that they were so high as the passing offense and had a bad offensive line. He was the RB4 for the first 11 weeks of fantasy football. When did the playoffs start? 14? Uh, in most leagues? 15. So, uh, you know, a uh, uh, majority of the season he was really valuable um, obviously it slowed down. The team fell apart, but, um, but yeah, I think that there will be value and look, it's a ninth round draft pick late night. Yeah. Um, we talked about the quarterback, Mike, I'm sure you're in agreement that there's value there. If he can oh, just yes. you know, run the football. Yes. Very, very much. Um, I know that the tight end room is worth a discussion. If we're, if we're talking about Jahan Dotson being a certified number two, <laughs> Zach Ertz is there. He was a, PPR godsend in Arizona Cliff with Kingsbury, Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff Kingsbury loves Zach Ertz, apparently. Uh, I expect Ertz will get a bunch of receptions. I mean, is, is he seriously – if he's being drafted as the tight end 36, like it's – that will not feel good. It, it will not feel good to put Zach Ertz on your team, but after week one, looking at, hey, the waivers, who's who, who had a decent week one? 
if Zach Ertz is on there with five receptions for 65 yards, it that will be not surprising in the least. You know who he reminds me of? Zach Ertz? Yeah, Zach, this year's Zach Ertz. Who's that? Logan Thomas. Yeah. He's right. like an old guy that's like, you know, it's like, oh, maybe he'll be involved. Maybe he could just PPR his way to relevance. And he might be, but he's got he's to gotta deal with the Senate. Yeah, well, yeah. Zach Ertz is being drafted way after uh, my guy Ben Sinnott, a.k.a. The senator. I am. The I forgot senator. you had a drop. I am very excited for the career of Ben Sinnott. He's, I'm he's not on, excited about his rookie year. He's on pace to be the next Trey McBride. Yeah. Hey. Which hey. is not that's, great right away, but great later. That's uh, if that's your type, I'll, Mike. I'll if you can identify fingers. those, the senator, and then uh, Trey. Mid I mean, middle of uh, middle of next year. Look for Ben Sinnott. All right, guys, we need to project this division. Man. Yeah. <laughs> who's who's got the stones, boys? I will go Dallas. Okay. Philly. Mm -hmm. Washington, New York. Come on, Jay. Mike? No, no, don't. No, no Jay. you're you're up. <laughs> you're up. You missed the last show. You gotta go next. Uh I will go. I have, I have Andy's order. Yeah. So Dallas, Philly, Washington, New York. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I don't know what you could be browsing that would help you right now I'm, on your I'm, computer. I'm, 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 like what could be telling you <laughs> facts about this situation at this point that benefit you? My whole hope here, w when looking at the Eagles v Cowboys at the top, is just what is the strength of schedule? They've got the ninth easiest strength of schedule. But really, if you're t if you're between. If you're not top five or bottom five in strength of schedule, I pretty much throw it out. I'm going to go with what I believe, which is Dallas number one, Philly number two, the Giants number three, and the Commanders number four. All so right. none of us had the courage to take one yeah. of the worst teams and put them at the top. You can still do it, Jay. You want to change? All right. I'm going to go Commanders number one. <laughs> Commanders, Giants. Philly. All right. That'll do it. NFC West show for our Saturday episode in – Guys, August is almost here. August is here. Five shows a week. August and 1st it, through the end of the year. Yeah, so August 1st is, is that Thursday? It is. So we will have the regularly scheduled Thursday show, and there will be a Friday show. Yes, yes. And then we will be five days a week. They're on out as football arrives. Yes. And if you're priming up for your draft, I mean, August is when it really gets going. So pick up the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com and check that out if you want to dominate your draft. That'll do it. You know, one of these days we should really thank these deucers for all that hard work. Maybe later, not on, today. later on. Episode 2000. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.